Okay, well, I think we can just probably go ahead and get started. Um, and I did not, I, I left my list of prayer concerns on my desk. So um, <laughs> um, who can, who do y'all need to mention tonight? As far as, I know, as far as I know, Angie Taylor will go for that chemo uh, treatment tomorrow. Okay, yeah, she's the one, the one from last week, which she right. didn't actually get, right? Right, okay. And I did, I did see Earl Powell today, and uh, he's doing well. I talked to Karen. She said Patrick's doing well. <clears throat> well, and let's also continue to remember. Um, um, I just went just as blank. I mean, I can't even. Sharon. I'm guessing Sharon. Sharon's husband. Sharon's husband. Yeah. Daryl. Daryl. I called Sharon, but I didn't get her. I left a message. So I didn't have, but I don't have an update. Do you, Susan? When did you call Violet? Um, probably yesterday, maybe was the it, day before. Was it afternoon or morning? Mm, afternoon, I believe. Sometimes in the afternoon, if you called her house phone, she says she takes it off the hook because that's when Gerald likes to rest, and she uh, she has a cell phone. I can text her her cell phone number. Oh, that would be good. Please do because yeah. yeah, because she says a lot of times she just takes the. The house phone off the hook right. so it won't bother him mm -hmm. if he's trying to get some rest. I've gotten her once or twice at home, but two or three times, no answer. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll text you tomorrow with the number. Hey, Bill. Hey. Yeah, there's Bill. Hey, Bill. Hello, Bill. Good evening. Anybody else? Good evening. Hey, Bill. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Um, let, let me just remind y'all of one thing just before before we have our prayer that we still need about 10 people to write devotions for the Advent devotion book. So if you're willing to do that, just let me know and I'll send you a scripture and then you can go from there. It's due, I can't re even tell you the exact date that it's due, but it's, a, it's about the third week in November. So you have three whole weeks to write it. I think you said November 18th, I believe, in that. Okay, okay. And that's about the third week, yeah. Yeah. So um, if you're willing to do that, please do it. Otherwise, Garrett will be writing 10. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Garrett. <laughs> no, I didn't agree to that. <laughs> um, and some of you have um, already said that you would, so I really appreciate that. I've gotten a few, I've gotten four already. <laughs> Some people are just right on the ball with that. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, let's have our prayer and then we'll get started with our study. Okay. Almighty God, we're truly thankful tonight that we can um, come to you um, in prayer and remember all of these that have been mentioned tonight. We know that there are quite a few in our church that are going through some difficult times and with some health issues, and we ask that your presence continue to be with them and that your um, healing um, hand continue to be with them as well. We ask that you give them strength each day um, as they continue on this journey. We ask, dear God, that you be with those who are in the path of um, the new storm that's brewing, um, and we ask that you just be with them and keep them safe as well. We ask also, dear God, that you be with us as a church. We ask that you help us to remember that we are the church, and when we go out into the community, that we are representative, not only of First Baptist Church, but more importantly, that we are representative of you, and we ask that you help us to be able to share your love um, each and every day with those that we meet. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so our scripture tonight is still from 1 Thessalonians. Tonight we're looking at chapter 2 and it's verses 1 through 8. Okay. 
For you yourselves know, brethren, that our visit to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the face of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from error or uncleanness, but nor is it made with guile. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never used either words of flattery, as you know, or a cloak for greed, as God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, whether from you or from others, though we might have been made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse taking care of her children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Now, if you'll remember, 1 Thessalonians is one of the earliest of Paul's letters, um, and it was probably um, also one of the first books to be written in the New Testament. In chapter 1, Paul, um, if you'll remember from last week, was giving thanks for the church at Thessalonica, and he really had nothing but good things to say um, about them, how they had been imitators of the Lord and of Paul and Silas and Timothy, and how they were examples to others. So as we begin chapter 2, Paul, the background for this, Paul has been slandered by the religious Judaizers who claimed that he was only out for personal gain. Now, what do you think that, or what did they think Paul would have hoped to gain personally? Why were they saying Paul was only out for personal gain? Any, any thoughts about why? Other than the things that he named were not the reasons. Okay. So that right. leads me to believe not seeking men's glory and, you know, that type of thing. Okay. Lavery and all that stuff. Right. right. Just things not to do. Okay. All right. Um, I think that they were probably trying to silence him. Um, and so anything that they could do or anything that they could come up with um, were things that they would say um, about him. Um, and so Paul essentially is saying, hey, these are lies. Nothing, um, this is nothing further from the truth. So um, he is trying essentially though um, in 1 Thessalonians 2 to silence those attacks as well. Um, in verse one, Paul and Silas and Timothy's work, um, he says we're not in vain um, it, in vain could also mean it wasn't without purpose, it wasn't without content, it wasn't without results or without truth or power. Um, and he is appealing in verse 1 to their personal knowledge of them um, and of their life and of their ministry. He says, you yourselves know. Um, so it would be like us saying, hey, you know me, you know that that's not the kind of person that I am. So um, he, in fact, he appeals to their personal knowledge of them six times throughout this letter. And it's a very short letter, it's five chapters. Um, so um, that's what Paul is doing. His life and, and his ministry and his motives um, were above rep reproach and that's what Paul is um, trying to remind them of. Um, so what does that say to us about the nature of our own lives and our own ministries? When Paul is saying to them that, hey, you know me. What does that say to us about the, the kind of lives that we should live? You make ourselves known and available to others. 
Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Violet. I didn't hear what you said. I said we should make ourselves known and available to others. Okay. All right. For one thing. All right. How about the kind of lives that we live? Can that be the kind of lives that we live? Can that be separate from the things that we say? Surely could be. From okay, or from or from the gospel that we proclaim. Should our lives be different than that? I mean, I think it, it shouldn't be different, but I think oftentimes it is. And that's to the detriment of our own witness, but then like also the detriment of the, the witness of the gospel and of our church specifically. Right, right, right. Um, so are there other, are there times though in our own lives, in our own, um, in our own world that we see others using ministry for personal gain? Yes. Okay. Unfortunately. Yeah, un unfortunately, and a lot of times, um, and I, you know, I hate to say this because I, you know, I, I don't know everybody's heart, but a lot of times with big mm -hmm. name ministers, a lot of times you wonder if they're not using um, their ministry for personal gain, particularly if they own their own jets and <laughs> live in these multi-million dollar um, houses, then we kind of wonder, hmm. Wow, I thought Jesus called us to a life of poverty. No, I don't think <laughs> so. All right. Um, Susan, that reminds me when I was a staff at Ridgecrest. Uh -huh. We were so happy this famous name that I won't call was coming for the week, and we just thought that was so wonderful. Uh huh. He mistreated the staffers. <gasps> we were just like nobodies. Oh my but he mistreated us the whole week. Oh, and we were just so hurt done. And yeah. I hadn't thought about that in years to you. Yeah, that, that really that. is a letdown when things like mm -hmm. that happen. Yeah. Okay. But then, you know, as far as his performance to the people who had paid the registration, who had come to Ridgecrest, thought he was wonderful, you know. Well, maybe that's because he knew that they were paying. <laughs> Their money that they had paid to go to Ridgecrest was actually paying his salary for the week. <laughs> They were going to give him the accolades too, you see. Right, right. Um, when I was in seminary, we had a um, an adjunct professor, and I took his class, and I can't, and it, he actually was an employee with the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina, and um, and he taught this class that I was taking. I can't even remember what it was. Really nice man. I thought he was, you know, his class was great and everything, and the next semester, we found out that he had been arrested in Charlotte for solicitation mm. Mm. and I was like well <laughs> there goes that <laughs> no it was not <laughs> it was not but it was it was a really really sad sad thing okay looking in verse two then um Paul says that um let me let me look at this real quick and I've got my very tiny print, so I'm having a hard time reading. Um, we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi. How were they treated? You, you can kind of look back in Acts 16 um, to find out how they were treated while they were in Philippi. They were thrown in jail. They? They, they were thrown in jail, right. And before that, they were publicly beaten in the streets. So, um, so they were treated very, very poorly. But then he goes on to say, but we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the face of great opposition. So tell me what the word courage means to you. Or, or in this case, what would, would what would the word courage mean? Well, you have courage in your convictions. Okay. And I think that's what they have, the convictions about their God, and that's what they have the courage to promote and tell. Okay. All right. Of course, you can have courage in a lot of things, but I think that's what they're referring to. Right, right. Um, 
So, or maybe even um, boldness. They were bold in their ability to, um, to declare the gospel or even confident um, in God that they were doing the right thing and doing it for the right reason, even though they faced great opposition. You know, I really wonder oftentimes what we would do if we were persecuted, if we were jailed, if, if bad things really happened to us, or, or if we faced great opposition because of our Christian um, lives that we were living, what would we do? Because I don't think any of us have ever faced that. So, you know, I, I'd like to think that we would all have courage to um, still, um, to still proclaim the gospel. I might just crumple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and we, and we, might, we might just crumble. Yeah. Okay, look at the next little phrase. We had courage in our God. Now, if you read that without the in our God part, does it change the meaning of what Paul is trying to say? Um, for instance, let me just read it. We had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. Da, 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 da. But then if you leave the part out about in our God, and he says, we had courage to declare to you the gospel of God in the face of great opposition. So does the in our God part change the meaning of what Paul is trying to say? It definitely takes the emphasis off of self. It does. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, I, I think that there are plenty of people that might have courage but they might have it for all the wrong reasons. Right. Um, but Paul and his fellow workers were bold and they were, and they had courage and they had confidence um, and they were willing to suffer because of the relationship that they had with the Lord. Can y'all see, yeah, okay, I'm just, I just did something strange to my computer. I don't know what I just did. Okay. Um, okay so the point Susan, of uh -huh. I just want to point out I think there's a difference or just a distinction to make between well I just want to say you can be courageous and have courage but you can still be scared um so saying we don't know how we would react if we were faced with some of the things that people in other countries are faced with um you know, it says in Joshua, you know, be bold and um, and of, of good courage, you know, the Lord your God is with you. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean you, you can't be scared because we're human beings, but I think being courageous means being able to go forward despite being scared. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point, um, Sarah. I think you're right. Um, and I think it would only be natural for us to be scared um, if we were being persecuted. Because um, if you're not, then you're you're foolhardy. You're you know that's I don't know that would be not normal if you weren't scared. Right. But you can go forward and be of good courage, knowing that you have God. Right. Right. There's a good John Wayne quote that goes along with that. It's, it says that courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. when Sarah said that, it reminded me. I knew it was a, a John Wayne quote that went on. <laughs> yes, that's exactly, that, that's exactly know, right, though. Yeah. That's exactly right. I'm sure that our, our military people and police and anytime they go into dangerous situations, there's got to be some fear there. Um, but there is courage that, that just keeps them moving, Keep, gets them in the saddle, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, okay, anything, any other comments on that? That was, that was a good thing to point out, Sarah. Mm -hmm. I am so sorry. Emily, she's upstairs, I'm saying, you're on dog duty tonight. <laughs> okay, um, let me see. Okay, so in our own lives and in our churches, how can we speak and how can we show and proclaim the gospel with courage or with boldness?
what are some ways that we can show the gospel with courage and boldness? I think to give God the credit when we should give him the credit for things that happen. Okay. Very good. Exactly right. And sometimes I think that um, it's our natural tendency to say, hey, look what I did. And, and for us to take the credit when really it's all that, that God needs to receive all of the credit for it. Okay, how about if there's some conflict within the church? How can you, how can we speak um, and live with boldness or with um, courage? What's, what's the easiest thing to do if there's some conflict? Leave. Uh, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> or just pretend that it's not happening or just go, oh, well, you know, they're just like that anyway. So, you know, whatever. Um, so how can we um, speak or show boldness, though, or courage? I mean, I think, I think so often in the gospels, like with Jesus, what's remarkable is that well, like when the Pharisees and the Sadducees have like some objection, they don't voice it directly to Jesus. So it's unclear as to whether Jesus even heard it, but like Jesus doesn't wait for it to get to him. He like calls it out. He kind of preempts their uh, criticism or their concern, you know, I mean, and I think you're, you're right in churches so often we know there's disagreement most of the time it's minor, but sometimes it's not so minor and, and we just ignore it maybe, or, or we just act like it's not there. And, and what happens is it festers and it becomes much worse than it would have ever been had you just addressed it. Right. Yeah, exactly. um, and I think, I think Jesus is a good example of that. I mean, he, I mean, I, I just, there, there's times when you read the gospels and it's hard not to laugh when the Pharisees have these objections and Jesus just like completely preempts them and says, you know, well, this is what you're thinking, but here's why, here's where you're mistaken or something like that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, um, so I think it's, I think we need to remember that Paul's boldness in his speech was probably not always the most popular thing in the world, yeah. but um he went on with it anyway. He did it anyway. Um, and that, that takes courage. It does take courage. Yes, it oh. does. Okay. So then we go on to verse three. Um, <laughs> I love it when that happens. Our appeal does not spring from error or uncleanness. So um, and then, or nor is it made with guile. So I think Paul is saying um, that our appeal is not from selfish motives or from personal ambition or pride or greed or anything like that. Um, so he's, he's again trying to defend himself. Um, but then he goes on in verse four to say, um, but just as we have been approved by God, what does that mean? How does how did God approve Paul? So Paul was not an, a, a new person to this. He had been at this for quite some time, and I think his um, the the time and his character had been proven. So that I think that God um, did approve of him. Um, but then he said, um, approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Now, what do you think it means to be entrusted with the gospel? What would it mean to you if, to know that God has entrusted you with the gospel? Is that a response? To spread, spread it to other people. Okay, okay. So then if God has entrusted us with the gospel, just like God entrusted Paul with the gospel, does that um, give us a great responsibility? Yes. Yeah. To that... share. The responsibility to share it and also responsibility not to distort it. 
there, change yeah, your dad exactly to it to right. boyfriend. You're right. And I don't think that we can look at that part up, um, about um, in being entrusted with the gospel without reading the rest of that verse that says, not to please men, but to please God who tests our heart. Um, so if we are trying to please men or people, then we certainly can't be pleasing God. And I think that if God entrusts us with the gospel, then we need to remember that when we share the gospel, it is to please God and not other people. And so in what ways in our churches, what ways do you think we try to please men rather than God? I was just going to say that in our culture, we're actually encouraged not to share the gospel. Right. So that's unfortunate. How we're all very quick to share with friends or even somebody we don't know very well the fact that there's a great deal at Costco or Sam's Club or, <laughs> or we just saw this great movie you know, that they ought to check out or things like that. We're quick to share, but we keep the gospel to ourselves because we're told in our current culture that we don't, we're not supposed to offend anybody okay. by share, you know, by sharing it. Yeah. And I think that's a very good point. And that's, that's a good example of trying to please men or trying to please people rather than trying to please God, because that's not what God would have us do, right? Yeah, why would you not want to share something that has changed your life and brought you everlasting life? Right. Why would you want to keep that to yourself? But then, like I said, you'll tell about any other thing you can imagine. You can right. share it. Right. So. But you're exactly right. Um, Sometimes I think um, from from a minister's perspective, and Garrett, you can weigh in on this too. Sometimes we um, bite our tongues and keep from saying things um, that we really want to say, or even things that we think God would have us to say because we're afraid of what other people might, how they might react. Is that true, you think? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even even so far as what, um, you know, even so far as what you might would say in a sermon sometimes, because you're thinking, oh, should I say that or not? Gosh, if I do, I'm really going to hear about it tomorrow. So, and, and in that case, we're pleasing people rather than pleasing God. Okay, are other ways that you think we try to please people rather than God? And it doesn't have to necessarily be within the context of the church, but in our in our daily lives. Okay, well, I, let's move on then. Um, I think though that when we when our main goal is to please people, then we actually lose our capacity to please God. So I think that's important when we're talking about our Christian witness is making sure that that it is God that we are trying to please rather than others. Okay, let's move on and look at verses five and six. Um, we're going to look at those together. For we never used either words of flattery, as you know, or a cloak for greed as God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostle of Christ. Okay, um, flattery, I think, um, has this idea or this connotation of deception for a selfish end. I think that um, we all like a little flattery, um, but why do we want that? Just to make us feel better about ourselves, right? Um, and likewise, when we flatter other people, why do we do that? Try to make them feel better. Try to make them feel better. But sometimes also 
making brownie points. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was getting ready to say. Yeah, uh, yeah. making brownie points. Um, and and um, even even as ministers, sometimes we might do that because we might think, well, you know, I, I'll do this because then maybe they won't get on my case so bad when I really mess up with something else. Um, and sometimes we use flattery as a way to even try to get people to do better. Like we might say, oh, yeah, we're doing such a great job. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this because I do it with our choir and I do oh. it with you all the time, don't I? Y'all <laughs> are doing such a great job, even when it really is not that great. Y'all are doing such a great job because I think that will encourage them to work even harder and to do even better, try even better. Um, so, but Paul says, we didn't do this. We didn't use flattery or greed. Um, so, um, are there, are there other things that you can think of that, um, we might use flattery for or greed? Okay. All right, let's go on then to verse seven as we finish up. Um, we were gentle among you like a nurse taking care of her children. If you think, um, and, and we've all had um, children and, we're, and, and young children and grandchildren, and when you're taking care of um, children, what is your main focus? Taking care, care of their needs, making sure that they're comfortable, making sure that they're safe, making sure that they get everything they need. And when we're taking care of them, it is done out of pure love um, for that child. And so that's what Paul is saying. We did, we, um, we took care of you. We were gentle among you, like a nurse taking care of her children. So Paul's goal then was um, to take care of the, uh, the Thessalonians. And then he goes on to say, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. Now, let me ask you this. Is it possible to share the gospel and not, share yourself hmm. I mean I think based on my understanding of the gospel no but in the same token you know I think there are times when that's what we do um Yeah, and I, I think you're. I think you're right, Garrett. I think um, really in 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 sharing the gospel that we should um, share ourselves because we are caring for the other people and we are loving other people, just as Christ has loved us. So we should be doing that. Um, I guess we could be sharing the gospel but not in a deeper sense you know just sort of telling facts or something right just but just that's not of, really sharing yourself it's yeah, like just, just kind of a surface thing on the surface and not going deeper yeah but i think if we're going to share the gospel truly share the gospel we have to share what christ has done in our own lives we have to share yeah. what our relationship with god is to us personally uh, we can't just say, hey, here was this great man, and he was God's son, and he came, and he, he lived, and he did great things, and he died on the cross for our sins. I don't think that we can do that without saying, without sharing, this is what he's done in my life. And that means sharing ourselves and opening up. That's um, what we should do. That, that's what we should do. You're exactly right. All right. Well, that's as it's written here, it says, share the gospel. As we share the gospel, it, it, the, I think the understanding is we're sharing it with people who haven't heard it before. So if that's what we're talking about, then I think 
there's uh, instruction that we have to go beyond just sharing the head knowledge of what the gospel is supposed to be because the Great Commission said not just that, but to make disciples as well. And so the beginning of this is to share it, but also to immediately. I think we think that's something that can be separated by years, but but really it I think it's meant to be immediate from when you share it, you also then help disciple that person or find others that will help disciple them so that they grow in the faith. Right. And, and the way it was written here in, in my Bible, it says he was as a nursing mother, not just as a nurse. He was as a nursing mother with them, um, with, as a nursing mother takes care of their children, meaning feed them and help raise them up. Right. So uh, that took way longer to say, but what it means is the letting them see how you live out the gospel is an important part because that's part of discipling them after you've shared the word. Right, right. And we share, I think it's important for us to remember too that we share the gospel not only by telling, but in living it. Um, in helping meet people's needs, we share the gospel um, by helping people out, by, um, by helping with the, um, the Good Samaritan, for instance, by helping take furniture to those people that had been burned out by, um, you know, helping pay gas bills sometimes and electric bills and things like that. Um, we are sharing the gospel. And I don't, I'm not sure that we would really do that unless we cared about other people. And that, that's a part of sharing ourselves um, with them. Um, so let me ask you this, Paul faced a lot of issues. Um, do you think that these are issues that still plague the church today? What? What we've just been talking about is certainly today. <clears throat> we brought it up to today and from what's said from back then and we're bringing it to today. So yes. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are plenty of things that still, still all these issues plague the church today. Um, so um, in reading all of this today, how does, how does this speak to you personally? These few eight verses and knowing what kind of person Paul was and the way he interacted with uh, this church, how does that speak to you today personally? I would just say, for me, this um, says to me, you need to make sure you're doing things for the right motivation. Make sure that you are caring for people. Make sure that you are ministering to people. Make sure that you are sharing the gospel, but for the right motivation. Not to, not to please other people um, or to get brownie points or whatever, but to please God. That everything that we should, that we do, um, should be out of love for others and out of love for God. Anybody else have a, how, do, how this speaks to you personally? Well, it makes you feel like you're not doing enough. I'm sorry, after Barbara, every, just, it kind of broke It makes you feel like after everything that Paul sacrificed, it makes you feel like you're not doing enough. Yeah. Or you can do more. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Anybody else have anything that they want to share? Any anything in this scripture that sticks out at you, speaks to you personally? Okay. Well, I really appreciate all of you being here. I appreciate the comments and the the sharing and all of that. And we'll have a prayer and close and um, you can go on about your business for the night and we'll see you hopefully Sunday morning at 11 o'clock for worship, not 10 o'clock. And it's daylight savings time. So. And it's daylight, so you get an extra hour of sleep. Oh, wow. <laughs>
too. <laughs> Although I saw this funny thing today that said, why would we want another hour of 2020? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. That um, funny. Did you say something, Bill? I'm sorry. I don't know. I just laughed. Oh, you just <laughs> laughed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let's pray. Almighty God, you give us your word to show us how to love and how to live and how to care for others. We ask, dear God, as we go throughout our daily lives, that you would help us to check our motivation, to make sure that everything that we say and do is out of love for other people and out of love for you. We pray that we are, that you will help us to make sure that we are doing things that please you rather than pleasing others. These things we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen.